Welcome to the Strang Report podcast. You know, the eyes of the world are focused on the Ukraine. When the war started a couple of months ago, everyone was saying it would last only a few days. And here it is, late June 2022, and the Ukrainian people are standing strong. And today I'm going to interview Tatiana Guminyuk. I hope I said that right. right. She's going to tell us what's happening. I interviewed her only a few days after the war started. She has since relocated into Germany where I'm interviewing her today. And she's going to give us an update on what happened. My previous interview with her was my biggest of the year. You don't wanna miss this conversation with my new friend, Tatiana. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Strang Report with Stephen Strang, the founder of Charisma. The Strang Report aims to encourage you to experience the power of the Holy Spirit and to discuss spiritual issues facing the church, our nation, and the world. Welcome back, everyone. And Tatiana, thank you for fitting this in. It's six hours ahead where you are in Germany. Uh, I'm in the United States, of course. And with technology, it's amazing what we can do. When I went to the Ukraine in the early 1990s, around the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, you could barely get a phone call through. We had never heard of this thing called the internet. And now uh, we can get reports from what's going on in the Ukraine. But I'm mostly interested in what's happening with the church, what's happening with you and your family when I interviewed you before, and people can look that up on the Charisma Podcast Network, uh, you had had church service just two or three days into the war with the bombs going off and everything else. So why don't we start with you giving an update on what's happening, first of all, with you and your family, and then what's happening uh, with the church. And finally, before the, con uh, the podcast is over, we'll talk about what you think is happening with Ukraine and Ukrainian people? Sure. First of all, it's good to be back with you, Stephen. And I actually listened to my podcast that was on fifth day of the war. And today it's over a hundred day of the war and it's still going on. I'm heartbroken. Yeah, my family had to evacuate. It was uh, not by our own will, we had to leave and flee the war. It has been very hard, but God has been faithful. And right now I'm here because of God's faithfulness, protection, and because of many answered prayers, and of course, your listeners and you. Uh, my family had to evacuate after the first week of the war, the part of my family. So I have five brothers and I have four sisters. So I'm number nine in my family. Mm. My baby sister lives in Germany. So when the war started, that baby sister could not stay still. She said, get ready, come over. I cannot stand because everybody in Germany and in America saw 60 kilometer convoy coming from Moscow to Kiev. I was very, very strong in my faith that God would protect me. And I was willing to stay in Ukraine, no matter what. However, I have good friends in America. I have good friends in Europe. And a good friend, Paul Sussman from European Commission, calls me and says, Tatiana, you have to get out. This is your mission to get your kids. You don't know what can happen in five, in very, very soon. He was sitting at European Commission, seeing that convoy moving toward Kiev. And I am just below outside of Kiev. Well, I had another story of, of the fight, of internal fight, brother sisterly fight with my brother who has seven kids who has been to america has been to europe who has two houses has beautiful family wonderful kids 
the youngest is celebrate the youngest is three and the oldest is celebrating his birthday today 14 years old and i said slava you are leaving he says you're welcome to go i'm staying with my kids here i said what this is the war Everybody from our church took the kids out to the Western Ukraine. You cannot have your kids here. And he says, no, I'm staying here. He was telling me this because I was in denial. He was in denial of what was going on. When the bombing, real bombing started of our city, his kids started to throw up in the middle of night. When the air siren started to be very, very strong, we had to run to our cellars. Can you imagine seven kids, more kids in a cellar where you have potatoes, red beets, and all the cans for winter. You have to run there to hide in case the bomb will hit your house. So his kids started to throw up. And my brother realized he has to take his kids outside of the war zone. And on top of that, you always have Satan, evil. So imagine the war starts and his van is broken. We have an American lady who does the God's hidden treasures in Ukraine. And my brother helped her to get a van. And I, she was in America. I'm writing to her. I said, Nita, can we use your van to get the kids out? And she says, you are welcome to use the van, but only to the border. Then you can leave. How can my brother leave seven kids at the border? And what to do next? Seven kids. It's not one or two. So that was a fight. And then when my brothers other brothers who are still remaining in Ukraine, I still have four brothers who stayed in Ukraine, and this brother who was allowed by the law of Ukraine to leave. Did the government require all able-bodied men to stay so they could help with the war effort? Yes, there was a law. It was the mobilization of everybody, except if you have three or more kids, you are legally allowed to leave Ukraine. So at the first week of the war, many men escaped. Of course, they paid money, they bribed, they left Ukraine. Who had money? My brother had seven kids. He had full rights to leave the country. So for him, it was a fight. It was a denial in himself. It was a father's house that he did not want to leave. And it was seven kids that it's not easy to be with in the foreign country with foreign language and everything together. So God worked a miracle. It took a day to find the part for that van. My brothers and my nephews came and they worked in our yard to fix that van. And when van was fixed, we could leave early in the morning. So the kids were packing. My sister said, please take the most precious things and the most comforting things. Personally for me, it was, it was like God failed me second time. And I'm sorry to be emotional. The first time I shared with you, it was hard when my mom passed away right before my master's graduation. The second time, it's when God failed me because I said, I have strong faith. Stupid Putin is never going to do this crazy thing to fight with Ukraine. Come on. And I'm sorry to say, two months in advance, I had American friends who were telling me, Tatiana, are you ready? Have you packed? Have you gotten your ticket? Have you organized your family? What are you going to do when the war starts? And I said, oh, how little of faith you are. I am one who have strong faith the war will never ever start, come on. And that was my personal test of faith. So imagine when the war hit on 24th of February, I was paralyzed, I was in denial, 
and I could not even think what to do. So little by little, we came to realization what was going on, and especially when my city started to be bombed. God has made so many miracles while we were there the first few the first few weeks of the war. Tell me and my listeners about the miracles because we've been praying for miracles for the Ukraine and it inspires our faith. And one of those miracles you won't believe those are by because you God answered them. So this was the third day of the war. We are paralyzed we don't know what to do we come out because you know the bombing so everybody has to watch the planes are they bombarders or who are those planes imagine we're coming outside we're looking at the sky and there are two beautiful lines but they're like the hook over you two white lines and two white planes and then suddenly they disappear do you know what was that? That was a threat to my town. Two Russian bombarders were going to hit bombs on my city and mm. they drew this in the sky. And three hours later, we read in the news that there were two Russian bombarders over the Bila Tsarkva city and they were shot down and the um, pilots had decapul decapulated there in our city. Three hours we see and say, God, you just made, you just saved our lives. So this is just a very simple miracle of, I could have never be saying these words to you, what God did for us at that time. Another miracle, God worked with helping all the parts to get on time, get together, we packed and we left. And when we were driving, the bombs were hitting, you know, the, that evacuation road, the planes, Russian planes, they started to bomb even the people who were evacuating. So we just heard that the bombs landed a little bit farther than we have passed. And we were just thinking if we were two, three hours late, we probably would be in that part of the road. So that's another miracle that God somehow saves you for a reason. Well, you have an amazing story. And, um, you know, for those who maybe didn't hear the first podcast, why don't you just give us a short uh, update on your life? Uh, you know, I'm interested, of course, in your eyewitness account of what you saw in the Ukraine and then what's happening since then. And I have a whole lot more questions, but probably my listeners are wondering why your English is so good. But it's because you studied in the United States and at one time thought that you would live here. Just bring this up briefly. And then I want to talk from February 24th. And uh, I interviewed you five days later. And then what's happened since then with you and your family. And ultimately, we'll get back to going back to Ukraine and what you think is going to happen there. So uh, just update us on who Tatiana is. Sure. Uh, usually when I introduce myself in America, I say, I'm Tatiana from Ukraine. And when I came to America in 94 to study to Pensacola first, then I transferred to Bob Jones. You know, everybody was thinking Ukraine is Russia. And I said, no, I am from Ukraine. So instead of saying I'm Tatiana Guminyuk, I would say I'm Tatiana from Ukraine. <laughs> so everybody knew Tatiana from Ukraine at that time. Um, God has allowed me to study in the United States. And honestly, I came on the work study program. I pretty much earned every penny for my education in the United States because I was working and paying for my education. And when I was graduating from Bob Jones University with master's in English and my bachelor's were actually minor was German because I knew I would return to Europe. I would need to speak another language and my major was English. And I had a beautiful professor, Günther Solter, Dr. Günther Solter, German professor. Now I understand what he taught me then because I'm in Germany right now. I am 
revive in my German language that I studied in America 20 years ago. And now I am putting all the dots together, what he meant, what he was sharing, and what he was teaching us about Europe, about life, about God, and about trust to God. So I was very ambitious. I mentioned I wanted to work in, New in White House, but because I was a student at that time, I did not have clearance. I didn't have the paperwork, though I had connections. My roommate was working in White House at that time. So I could not get the job. So God allowed me to work behind the scenes in White House. I, I was in Washington, D.C., and I got connected with National Prayer Breakfast. And there were lots of ups and downs in my life. But God has allowed me to be involved in a prayer ministry behind the scenes of many political leaders and powerful people. And I'm telling you today, I see how God takes you in his hand and he takes you through. And if you trust him, he orchestrates the way I would never ever imagine even to do how he orchestrates every step and takes me through life and using me anywhere I come, in America, in Europe, or in Ukraine. Okay, let's go back to Kiev when the war started. You know, Putin and the Russians were making it sound like it was going to be over in a few days that Ukraine would just, we have an expression, roll over and play dead. You know, it was just overwhelming power and the whole world watched as Ukrainian people um, they were almost like uh, Winston Churchill in, in World War II when the Nazis looked like they were going to overtake England. And he said, we're going to fight them in the streets with pitchforks if we have to. And it was that kind of spirit. And uh, having been to Ukraine uh, several times, I had come to believe that Ukraine were a strong, independent type of people. And I would have been comparing it to uh, meeting Russians and Latvians on the same trips that I took over there. And uh, I was mostly with Christians and I saw with my own eyes that the church in Ukraine at that time seemed to be pretty strong. And I've since learned that it is probably the strongest country in Europe when it comes to Protestant churches. Uh, why don't you just give us a brief update on that and then go from February 24th or a few days later when we did our last podcast, which I said at the beginning of the show was my biggest of the year. It shows I've had two or three other Ukrainian podcasts that were also big, but the one with you really connected with people in some deep way. And then how, how you fled, you talked about your denial. You obviously believe that you needed to go. You went out of the country. Germany is quite uh, a ways from the Western border. So bring us up to date. Sure. First of all, let me share about Ukraine, about Protestant movement in Ukraine. Ukraine is size of the Texas and the population of Ukraine used to be 48 million. And we had the biggest percentage of, Christ of, of Christians in Ukraine that probably you take Russia or former Soviet Union. And the Protestants were very, very vibrant, live, and even sent missionaries to stand countries, to Turkey, to wherever, because um, they were very major churches. That was during the communism. The underground persecuted. They were Baptist, Pentecostal churches, two major Protestant churches, um, they, and then the Orthodox church. We did not have many Seventh-day Adventists, whatever, or other, but we've got new denominations when the uh, Iron Curtain fell, so from the West came. But those were major denominations that were strong and survived the communists. So I come from the Baptist Mennonite background. The Pentecostals also are very strong, very sincere and genuine people in Ukraine. 
And they, they, the Baptist Union and the Pentecostal Union and the other unions, they have been very, very vibrant. They have been very working hard, bringing people to God and spreading the word of God outside of Ukraine. So talking about my church, even it's not at that, you know, it's kind of Mennonite, the church I grew up, but they were strong, vibrant, and strong in faith. And they were still getting together during the war. And right now, the church is getting together. My brother is a pastor, a pastor in a village church, and he is a pastor, and he pastors and he helps the church. Half of the church is gone, was gone the first few weeks. So he said, there are no people to, there are no pastors, no spiritual workers, and people are ready to die. People don't know how to die. We don't know what to do. Let me share one experience of my brother that really touched my heart. My brother lives close by to us. So when we left, he shared that his neighbors come and say, Victor, we want to talk to you. Can you pray with us? We want to repent. We don't know if the bomb is going to hit us today or tomorrow. We want to be ready to, to, to meet death. So my brother comes to the neighbor across who has the uh, diabetes and his wife was Russian. And he says, Victor, let's pray and let's talk. So my brother says, open the Bible scripture and says, listen, God says you have to take him in your, you have to repent and believe that he is your savior and you will be saved right now. The man took, became, got saved and his Russian wife was crying and say, Lord, forgive me, forgive my people what they are doing. I'm living in Ukraine, forgive them too. And that was a beautiful time of reconciliation with God. Can you imagine the next morning, this wife comes to my brother and says, Victor, Nick is dead. He's gone to see Jesus. Can you imagine that? This is like, Lord, your timing, people, it's just amazing. So when I left with my brother, we had to take, we had a convoy of cars. We had two, three cars with us following. My brother in the van with seven kids, I was with them. Those are my nephews that I was spoiling from United States. I would teach them English. And can you, can you imagine I would motivate them and say, okay, kids, if you learn English, you are going with me to America. I'm taking you to America. Tell me who would not want to go with me to America, but there was a prerequisite, you learn English. So everybody was learning English. Well, my sister lives in Germany and she has Russian German brother. She adopted a Ukrainian orphan 10 years ago. They got Ukrainian daughter. Now they've got a foster child, German Italianish kid from Germany. So now that kid teaches me to speak German with her whenever I would come and visit them on the way to Ukraine. So when they came to Ukraine, I say, kids, now you have to speak German with Caitlin, with your cousina. So now another, if you learn German, we'll take, we'll go to Germany and after Germany, we'll go to America. So these kids were living in reality, when I was, when I had no clue, it will happen the way that I could never even imagine. So imagine we got all together, these kids, and I said, kids, take all the most important things, the most valuable things, what you want to have with you, and then we go to Vera to Germany. It will take us a long time, but we will get there. So these old kids are so excited. They are on a journey to Germany. But Paul Sussman really got very nice people for us in Romania. And I called them Romanian angels who took care of us. So we drove through this post, through this bombing. We drove to Chernivtsi, the Western part. We stayed overnight with beautiful angel in Chernivtsi. And the next morning we had to go and stay in a line, 10 kilometer line at the border to cross to Romania. If you could experience, if you could see what I've seen, my heart was broken. I could not believe. We are sitting in a car with kids. It's cold. I'm glad we took our blankets. We were covering ourselves in blankets. We had our warm clothes on and I see people walking handicapped 
mothers with two, three kids on their arms, they could not, they have to stop at the gate and cross the border to Romania because they did not have a vehicle like we did to go. So the bus would bring thousands of refugees or these evacuators who would stay on the line. What I saw, I was thinking and reminded of World War II, of all these women who were escaping, of Jewish people who had to flee. And I said, Lord, how can this happen to my nation? It's 21st century. Is this a reality or not? So we had to stay for a day and night at the border. When we crossed the border to Romania, you cannot even imagine how many people. I'm so grateful to Americans who have been helping at the Romanian border. I'm so grateful to Romanians, to Polish, to people who really opened their hearts and hands and houses to Ukrainian refugees who had to flee the country to escape the bombing and the war. I am grateful for that. Well, you know, I've done some podcasts with different ministries who have gotten Christian people to help by open their homes, but also churches that turned their sanctuaries or classrooms into dormitories for temporary housing. And then they would help sometimes, or usually they would move them on. Millions of US dollars have been raised from private sources in addition to whatever the government seems to do. And there's been a lot of controversy over here because for reasons we don't need to go into, baby formula is hard to get in America, but America was sending baby formula to the Ukraine. But what we've covered is Christians and churches and ministries like Convoy of Hope and City Serve and Samaritan's Purse who are helping. We have also raised some money through our mission called Christian Life Mission. It's not a big ministry, but when we do a podcast like this, or if we do an article, as we've done over the years, people's hearts are touched, Tatiana, and they want to help, and we make it easy. If they send the money to us, we will send 100% to the ministry involved. And usually what we do is small things that fall through the cracks with the big ministries or with the government. Individual families or churches or needs that come to our attention. We have raised some money for you. And this week, we're sending you a check. Um, it's not a lot of money. It's about 6,000 US dollars, but hopefully you can put it to good use. And I'm hoping the people will respond to this podcast as well. And as long as the money keeps coming in, even into the future, we will have a Ukrainian fund. And as needs are brought to our attention, we will send it and we, we uh, vet it the best we can, usually by getting people that we know and trust to say these are legitimate and the, and the money will be used this way. And often it's things like buying blankets and things like that that just help people will want you to be able to put it to need to use where it's needed most. So why don't you tell the need? And I'm going to invite people to write to Christian Life Missions, 600 Reinhardt Road, Lake Mary, Florida, 32746. It's in USA, of course. And there's also, you can go to christianlifemissions.org, org, o -R -G, uh, and it's probably easier and faster, of course, to give online. And, and our pledge is that 100% of what comes in. So we're just kind of a passive pass through to try to connect the donors where the needs uh, exist and that we have vetted. An individual American can't send money to the Ukraine. They would have no, they would not know who to send it to. And they don't know if they could trust the person. There are a lot of other ministries, City Serve, Convoy of Hope are the two that, that we work with the closest. They take in truckloads of goods and other things that the people need. 
There are several million refugees. There's been nothing like it since World War II. You mentioned that a minute ago. The nice thing about a podcast is you could uh, rewind it, so to speak, and listen to it again so you can write it down. And people have done that. That's how we, we have helped some other Ukrainian uh, ministries and your ministry is next. Like I said, we will be sending you a check uh, this week. And as this podcast plays in the future, anything that comes in, our pledge, if they put on the donation, Tatiana or Tatiana of Ukraine or something like that, and we'll know it's for you and the church you're a part of and your family. So go ahead as we wrap up this short podcast. I'll give you the last word by sharing the need and telling people how they can help. First of all, thank you very much and for everything, what you have done from your part, from Europe, from Germany, from Poland, everything counts and helps. But for me personally, I also like to entrust money to people that I trust, even in Ukraine. Believe me, there are many different ways, but we know sincerely where the need is. And the needs are great in helping with food, in helping with gas, in helping with children's um, formula and everything like that. But the needs are also in Europe too for refugees who are here. And one of my hard desires to have the um, war trauma retreat rehab centers for women with kids because they are, they are without husbands for three months. It's not easy and their husbands in Ukraine by themselves. Also for kids to have camps in Europe to revive. So I am taking 15 teens to Austrian camp that is already done by Austrians, but they allowed me to bring 15 Ukrainian refugees. So one of those needs also to get them there. And we are looking for partners for organization that can help us to Host these kids so they can revive and hear. And this is Christian sports camp in Austria. But God, I have been, my brother just took um, a humanitarian aid from a church here in Germany. He was driving the van with the truck full of stuff for my family, for people there, for my neighbors, just a little, you know, pack of candies, just the little soap or gel to bring to them and the Bible. And what's wonderful, people here, they make a box and they put a letter, the friend, this is for you from people in this village. This is for you from people who love you and pray that this comes to you as God's provision. So the funds are always welcomed. I am dreaming to get my brother a new van for his kids but it's in God's hands. And I know that God will provide every cent for good cause to help hurting, heartbroken in Ukraine and here, wherever we are. Well, thank you for sharing and thank you for standing strong and helping so many people. And, and I'm thankful that God can use our, uh, our attempts to help uh, to help you help those people as you described. And as I said, if you write to Christian Life Missions, put Tatiana of Ukraine, and the address is 600 Reinhardt Road, Lake Mary, Florida, 32746. And you can also go to Christian Life Missions, all one word, dot O-R-G. You can also give there. And thank you for listening to the Strang Report today. Share this with others. The other podcast, the last time I checked, was over 180,000 downloads. And that's only because people like you were touched and shared it with friends. There's no way we can do all that publicity to get a podcast that big. Most of my podcasts are in the 15 to 20,000 range. 
So you can see it was huge interest. And I believe that there'll be huge interest in this. And I hope that there was an outpouring of support that we can uh, share with Tatiana and help in a small way. The need is so much greater than what we can do, but each of us can do our part and together we can do more than we can individually. Thank you for listening. Tune in again tomorrow and remember to share this important podcast with Tatiana of Ukraine. God bless you. Thank you for listening to The Strang Report with Stephen Strang. Stay up to date with the latest episodes by subscribing on YouTube and Rumble, as well as your favorite podcast app at cpnshows.com. Get the latest reports delivered directly to your inbox by subscribing to the newsletter at strangreport.com.